Hey there, everybody. Thanks for joining in tonight. This is the Urban Bourbon Hour coming to you live from Chicago, the Urban Bourbon Bunker. And tonight uh, I'm going to have uh, Christian Huber from Starlight Distillery on. A uh, really cool guy, really great up-and-coming distillery that I think you guys will enjoy uh, learning more about. So Christian has already requested here, so let me bring him in. How's it going? Hey, Christian, how are you? Doing well, doing well. How about yourself? Doing really, really well. Thanks for, uh, thanks for hopping on here tonight and, and joining me. And I see you're there uh, with the still. Yeah, a, little, a nice little backdrop. How about that? Yeah, that's really cool. That's very, very cool. Hmm. Um, yeah, so thanks, thanks for hopping on and, uh, and, and doing this. I think uh, it'll be fun to talk to you again and fun um, for people to learn uh, a lot more about you and, and about Starlight Distillery um, because you guys have kind of like, you guys have a buzz about you right now out there in, in the social media world, in, you know, in the world of whiskey. There's a real kind of buzz around Starlight Distillery. So let's start off by, first, I want to pour an apple brandy, and this is your bottled and bond apple brandy, because I know this is a big, this is like an important part of the history of the distilling at Starlight and your family. So for sure, why don't you, why don't you give us a little background on, on the family, on the farm and, and how er everything came to be there? Well, so thank you again for having me on. And honestly, it's a pleasure. And I mean, as a little bit of history about myself, I'm the seventh generation to be working here on the farm. Uh, my dad and Blake, they're waving out of the window. They're actually headed home. So <laughs> while we're in the distillery, we were all working together tonight. Um, so they're actually on their four-wheelers leaving to go back home. Uh, but yeah, Starlight was founded back in 1843. So by my great, 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 great grandfather, um, Simon Huber. Now he found this estate under grapes. So he established this as a winery. Um, so Simon as a whole growing uh, Riesling, Blauburgunder, Spotburgunder, um, and basically started this estate as a winery. Unfortunately, or for him, his knowledge that he didn't know about a, a, of an American root louse called Phylloxera that killed off mm. all of his vines. So when it came to it, uh, even though Simon got the vineyard started, he grew them up. It was a flourishing winery. Eventually, the Phylloxera killed him off. Um, so at the time, his son Ignatius took the property, and that's when you saw us getting into the fruits, like you said, the apples, the peaches, the strawberries, the blueberries, the blackberries, and then everything of that nature. Now, Ignatius started growing that and just selling it as a commodity, not actually as alcohol. So he's the only one in the, really the trend that didn't have an alcohol-based company. Um, Charles thought it was going into the Great Depression and into Prohibition. So as a total, as a farmer, I mean... You had one out really to sell, your, to sell your grains and to sell your fruit. And when everything hits the fan, I mean, they had to do something. And as a winemaking background, I mean, they were trained to ferment fruit. Now, fruit wines don't hold very well, so what do they do? They start distilling it. Um, mm -hmm. So you see my great, great, great grandpa, Charles, and his dad, Ignatius, really started getting into distillation. And mostly was apples, because under our property, we had mostly apples. Um, and then you hear about the Ohio River Valley on the Indiana side doing more apple brandy. Um, and then we also did peach and grape. Um, and then we're putting those actually in charred and new American oak barrels at the time because um, that was what was available to them. Um, and then Charles, or Carl, excuse me, um, took the property over Charles. And Carl's the ones who first started the whiskey here. Um, so this is after Prohibition. Um, so he started the whiskey. Now this would be our standard of corn whiskey, really, really high corn and malted barley, new American oak barrels, um, our version of what corn whiskey is. Um, Carl had the still, and that's why it's named after our bourbon, because he was the first guy to produce it. Um, then my grandfather took the estate um, in the 60s and 70s. He got us back into winemaking. Um, so he started growing the, yes, he started growing the, uh, uh, the Vis vinifera again. So Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, Cipredo, Tanat, um, and like I said, Pinot Gris and Chardonnay to round out the whites. Um, and our 
portfolio from then grew as my dad took the estate, um, started getting more diversified within the winemaking. But in 2000, he said, you know what? We had such a rich history in distillation, and it's a huge backbone of who the Huber family was that we said, let's get back into it. So in 2000, my dad lobbied a bill here in Indiana to get craft distilling back started. Unfortunately, he was shot down, but he was allowed to get brandy, not the full distillation bill. So Indiana said, okay, you guys can produce brandy, can't produce grain-based spirits. So in 2000, we started the brandy distillery back up. Um, and that's when you saw our grape brandies, our apple brandies, our peach. We actually have a 14-year-old pear. Um, but nowadays, we have 18-year-old grape brandy. We have 10-year-old apple brandy, 14-year-old pear brandy. We do a bottle and bond apple. We actually have a limited edition um, peach. One of my good friends uh, found a bottle and bond peach. was a one-off project that we did way back when. Oh. Was so it, it diversified from then. And then my dad and so we started lobbying in 2006 to get the whiskey distillery passed, and it took them until 2013 to allow whiskey distillation. Um, but then Indiana didn't want that. They had one DSP that was running whiskey, and that's what they wanted, and that was Seagram's, now known as Indiana. Yeah. Um, but in 2013, they allowed us smaller guys to get involved, and we were one of the first to put our applications in, and then you can see one of the stills we put in behind us. I mean, got right back into it. I mean, like you mentioned, I know this is a long story short, but our family's been involved in distillation for quite some time. This is our 177th harvest on this property. Um, and we're 100% sustainable farming. So everything we do here is a sense of place. With craft distillation, we believe there should be a sense of terroir within it. Um, so whenever you have that sense of terroir and you have that sense of place, that's what craft distillation, that's why Starlight, we want it to be Starlight. We don't want it to be NGP, we don't want it to be Dickel or Buffalo Trace. When you have a bottle of Starlight, it's Starlight. And it's a sense yeah. of myself and my mash bill, my dad's mash bill, my brother's mash bill, and the whole team here at Starlight that we produce. And that's a little snippet. I, I know you want to go more and probably in detail on mash bill, but that's kind of the family history to get us into it. No, I absolutely love that. And I think it's it's amazing for people to hear that and like this this really rich family history that I mean, you're looking at almost, I mean, you guys are approaching 200 years is not that far off for your family to be on that piece of property and to be involved in distillation and winemaking and, and all of this that entire time is, it's really kind of, it's fascinating. So I'm glad that, that you shared it. Yeah. Um, there, there's one thing I want to touch on that you, you had commented on, and I think so if everyone out there, I, I've been down to Starlight. I did a, um, a single barrel pick with Christian and his family um, for Bourbon Charity, which is a, a, a barrel that's going to be coming out here uh, fairly soon. But I think you told me a story when I was there that from the time that like the distillation was actually approved by the state, there was like a pretty significant period of time where you guys were actually laying down product sort yeah. of in a practice type of way to, to kind of get your bearings and to figure out like what you were going to do when it became legal. Can you tell us a little bit about that time period and why that's very significant for you guys right now? Yes. Um, so as I mentioned, in 2001, we got into brandy, but... Brandy was the only thing we were allowed to sell, not the only thing we were allowed to make. So we were allowed to experiment with a little bit of everything. So in 2004, 5, 6, 7, 8, we were allowed to practice making whiskey. Now, we can never sell this whiskey, and it's still back there in the world today. Um, there are very early on mash bills. Unlike some craft distilleries around the nation, we had the very blessing of allowed to experiment pretty much before our actual go live date. So when we were playing with these mash bills back in, like I said, in that period of time, we knew what it tasted like at four years, at five years, at six years, and at seven years before we ever had the still behind me. I mean, we have an 80-gallon Christian Carl still um, that works as our brandy still, a beautiful still, and it was the first still I was ever taught to run. When I was 13 years old was the first day I ran the still by myself. Um, and as a Everybody who's watching, that is legal. If you're a son or daughter of an owner of a DSB inside the United States, you're allowed to practice, drink, and be able to be an artisan behind it. Um, so when I was 13 years old, and same with my brother, my dad said, all right, 
you're old enough, run the still, and I made apple brandy. Um, going back on topic, that 80-gallon copper pot still, um, we were cranking out whiskey when it came to rye, and it came out to be bourbon. And we're aging them back in warehouse number one. So if you want to go back there and try some 2007 and 2006, the very early on mash bills of what Starlight is, they're back there. I mean, now they're getting 12, 13, 14 years old. We know what our mash bills are going to taste like. And that's why when we did go live in 2013, we knew exactly the barrels we wanted. We knew exactly the mash yeast we liked. And that was a huge benefit, as well as we had the winery. So when people talk about you know, pushing out underage whiskey at two and three years old. There's, like I said, most distillers really, really had to do that. And even we had to, but we had the winery to back us with money. So when the winery basically came back and said, you know what, we're gonna support you guys putting these barrels back, the winery helped funded us. So we didn't have to dive into just two year whiskey all the time. And that allowed us to get to four to five to six. And our oldest barrels now within the 2013 law is seven years old. So we have seven year bourbon back there that's going to 10. And we have barrels that are going back for 25. Our normal set portfolio though is seven to about 11 on our curl T. And our single barrels are set to go nine to 14. And we have one mash bill that's about that 16 all the way up to 25 year range. Um, same thing with the rye. We make a rye that's very fruit driven forward that's going to sit about that 7 to 10 range for the blend. And then we have a rye that's meant to go 14 plus. Um, and also we have American malt whiskey. We haven't released yet, but we tried it today. I was on a, a single barrel experience for uh, Whiskey and Wishes. And they, uh, we tried an American malt whiskey. Um, it's six years old now. Um, it's actually set to be released at eight. Um, but we have a lot of things back there. But we're not going to release something we're not proud of. So everything that back there. Um, Starlight Picks, whenever you look at us, we're only doing very small selection per year. We're not cranking out a bunch of volume. Like I said, it's me, my brother, and my dad, uh, and Jesse. So four guys making very unique whiskey, but that's all that team. We don't have a team of barrel guys rolling around. So it's it's one of those things that we're we're constantly involved. I know exactly every, and if I did it in the Rick House, I know every barrel. It's not a number. It's like a sense of place. It's that it's that feeling, it's that part. I remember doing the cuts. I mean, on the barrel, I mean, it said, if I distilled it, if Blake, if my dad, and then you can see the proof level, but also you can get in there and taste the difference. And like, I'm so proud of it, but also I'm so picky on my own barrels forever. Like, <laughs> like I have went to whiskey and be like, all right, I messed this up. It was a bad fermentation. And then lucky enough, I have the brand, the Blackberry whiskey, that I can take that bourbon that I don't want, even if it's, a, even if it's at four years old, no distillers would cry dumping four-year-old bourbon out. But if it doesn't, yeah, would. you know what? It's going to go into our blackberry whiskey, and it's actually, I mean, it makes that product a better than just a normal flavored whiskey. So it's one of those things that forever at Starlight, we want to put out the best thing we can do. No matter. So that's kind of the kind of a little bit of a history behind that. I love that, and that that was a fascinating story when when I think you you told it when I was down there. But to be able to gather that, to sort of like gather that data on your product before you're even legally allowed to produce it, um, it it's it's pretty huge, and it's and it's really interesting to hear you talk about the specific products and saying like okay, we know that this mash bill or this product is going to be ideal seven to 10 year range or the, the rye at a, at a different range. Like that's, that's huge for a distillery to be able to know that, like basically from the time that you start legally yeah. being able to, to put the product into barrels that will be sold. Exactly. I mean, when it comes to data and figuring out your stills, no one's, and the reason why we're so transparent with everything we do here, no one can make our whiskey because no one has our equipment, our soils, our terroir, our rick housing system. No one else can do that. So, like I said, when you're figuring, as a distiller, when you're figuring out your mash bill, you're totally starting from scratch because the way you distill, where your distillery is located, where your rick houses are located, does like every variable comes in. So, there's not one mash mash bill that everyone can copy and make great whiskey a particular mash bill might work here in the old like the kentucky region 
But when you go down to Texas, Balcones guys, totally different. You go up to Nevada, smoke wagon, it's totally different. So when yeah. no information of like where our whiskey tasted at and we were happy with it was like the huge like aha moment to say, we got this. We know what it's going to be. Let's just wait on it and be patient. So, but yeah, it's something, uh, a little history about us as well. Like all the fermentations we do here, we're very geeky whiskey. My brother and I like both I mean, study viticulture and enology. So study winemaking, grape growing. He went to Cornell University in upstate New York. I went to Niagara College in Ontario. Miss it, still my home. Uh, I loved it up there. And like when it comes to like understanding wines and whiskey, I mean, where you travel, where you taste at. I worked in southern Italy for a while, then I worked in Napa Valley. But where I got my home in whiskey was right here on this property. Um, my dad was on the ADI board, ACSA board. And when I was a young boy, like 12, 13, 14 years old, I mean, at my house constantly was Dave Pickerel. Yeah, I love this story, yes. Dave and Dave, like both from High West and Dave Pickerel. I mean, having both those guys, like literally there as I'm growing up in the whiskey world. And I had no clue. Like I still know Dave, Dave not Dave as whistle pig or blackened or if it was hill rock or whoever like, i just knew my friend and he's the one who taught me how to taste and this is back at the time and i know adi if, if they're listening i was back when we're doing those competitions here in plantation hall when i was still in high school taste every craft whiskey that was coming out the young bowman releases the hill rock when it came down to jeb the creed like all the original releases from balconies corsair like all those guys i was tasting this whiskey out what I liked um, and I was able to listen to those guys who had very professional palates tell me if I was getting the right notes and tasting but yes I'm definitely for those who watch I'm definitely young I'm only 24 years old and I'm nowhere near a master distiller by any means I'm still learning I'm still adapting most of the whiskey that you have from me currently is actually what I distilled in high school if that that's, tells you that's amazing so, that's really amazing yeah, I mean, it is, that's one of those kind of laughing moments, but I mean, I was distilling on the weekends because that's what I love to do. I mean, I've got here at the winery at 3 a.m. and then distilled because I couldn't sleep. <laughs> uh, on the flip side, though, like my brother, my dad, and myself all have very different mash bills. As you taste yes. them, they are literally, when it comes to like understanding, they're drastically different, like particularly... If you talk about big brands, don't get me wrong, I love some NGP rye. I mean, Willits releases their old NGP rye. So I do my I do my rye very floral, but also very more on the citrus, not so much on the spearmint, but on that like burnt orange peel. I like a little bit of weight onto it and I love the tannin. On my bourbon, I'm a four grain typically, fifty one percent corn, twenty percent rye, twenty percent malt barley, nine percent wheat on the back. Oh. Um, my entry proofs, depending, go in at about 112 to 118. Um, so that's my particular one that I like. My Blake and my dad, Ted, very different mash bills. My dad's higher in corn. My brother is actually higher in rye. Um, he's like, my brother is like more of that OBSV for roses. The yeah, yeah. Very fruity, high rye spice. My dad is like, you have more of that old forester that's higher corn, so it's dense, rich complex whiskey with like the prohibition era and more that old school style um and then very mine i compared to like a lot more mictor's toasted head because i have a lot more charred and toasted heads in my actual like portfolio plus i'm using canton barrels um which i'll talk about the coopers but yeah yeah well and the other thing that makes this a little different is we're 100 percent mash and that's what I love because if you come down here during the winter, you'll see 10 to 15 five-gallon buckets filled with mash with different yeast trials going on. So you can individually like taste the yeast and how drastic that one, if it's Saccharomyces cerevisiae or the Saccharomyces cerevisiae with a Delbrook eye, how that influences your original, like your original go before it even ages, before it's ever in the still. Yeah. The yeast profile is totally different. And that's why we're sweet mash because we have that control of those yeasts and we adapt and change that. Um, we have three different yeasts. Um, we're closed top fermenters, so I can actually control the temperature onto them. So if I want to do a cool, slow fermentation, which I can do on my rise, but a little hotter and quicker on my bourbons, I can. I can extend that out a little bit shorter. 
And I, that all comes down with that winemaking philosophy. And then how we run these stills are like way different. The way I just like, this is a Vendome Brass and Copper, uh, 500 gallon pot, uh, big onion, big gooseneck coming across. And I'm gonna take you on a little tour. If yeah, that's yeah, okay. please do. Um, that, that, that so is awesome. Everything is done by hand here. Like I said, nothing is automatic. So everything from actually doing the cuts, and you can see from the last distillate we just got done with coming over. But, and then coming here to the back, everything here is done by check valves. I don't know if you can see that, but everything is done here by a check valve. So you actually have ultimate control over this pot. You're not cutting it based off a of proof. You're cutting it based off a of taste. And that yeah. particular taste of what we want, because I clean mine up quite a bit. So I'm taking about a one, depends, 58% alcohol is kind of where I cut the tails. I keep it pretty high. My dad goes a little, a little bit more into the oil. My brother cuts a little bit higher, but everything's cut by hand. And then when it comes to proof, like I gave you a proof range. We don't have an entry proof. It's not just 125. Yeah. Every day I taste the distillate and I dilute it down point by point by point until I find that happy pin. And then I dilute all the distillate down and go into not one, but six different cooperages that we have. Yeah, sitting this, here. this is, this is like, first off, we're, we're getting like an ultimate masterclass here from you tonight, which is awesome. I mean, this is the stuff that, that I just love. And to be able to like see the still like that. Um, but I wanted to touch really just quickly yeah. back on how, how you guys are truly hand crafting this because when I was there and you were telling me how you're doing that, that you're just doing the hand cuts by you're basically tasting it as you go. And you're saying, okay, this is, we're going to, I'm going to cut it here. Your brother might cut it somewhere else. Your dad might, might cut it in a completely different place as well. But that is like, to me, that just signifies the hand crafted way that you guys are making things. So I just wanted to like, Thank emphasize you. that to people that are watching because most most distilleries even craft distilleries that you go into these days it's it's pretty much computerized and the computer is doing the vast majority of the work not to say that the master distiller doesn't have influence over everything that's going on but but to you know be there and make it, be making the cuts by hand is just to me that's fascinating and I, th I just wanted to emphasize it. Well, and it is something cool. Like I said, when it's like, and someone said it best, like quality over, like consistency for me is boring sometimes. Like having the same whiskey come out the same. Like, yeah, if you go get a, get a brand, you want to have it somewhat consistent. For us, we like to have it kind of weird and wild, and that's why we have that, our names on And one of the cool thing is, when you do get a Starlight pick, look who distilled it. So you can right here that's my dad's signature you can see my dad on that one um on this yeah, particular this is your dad too yeah this is my brother's right here be a b huber um and then of course me being c huber so everybody puts their name on it so you know if you're going to get more of my dad style or my style or blake style it's the same thing like four roses is doing the recipe we're just doing with the distillers um, and that's kind of when you kind of say, oh, I know Christian's going to have a little bit more tannin, a little bit more of that fresh nuanced oak because he likes to use air dried wood with toasted heads. My brother is a little bit more of, like I said, you're going to get more fruit. You're going to get more spice. My dad, you're going to get a little bit more of that huskiness, the big body to the corn, the malted barley. Um, and that's why I put our names yeah. on it. So, but going back to it, highlighting it, that's with Starlight. I mean, I can tell you exactly where your corn is grown. I mean, I can go up to on our north block is where the Lancaster white variety of corn was grown. It went into me and Blake's um, four grain mash bills. It's aged in this barrel. And I can go within our computer system when we write all this data at. I know exactly the moisture temps, when it was harvested, when it was planted, and the whole nine yards behind that. And that's kind of what I love about craft whiskey is because we can do that EP because I don't have thousands and thousands and thousands of barrels. Every barrel, like I said, has a story, and we keep that story going. When I'm sitting here distilling, I'm putting in the distiller notes so I know the weather when I was putting it in. All that impacts that actual whiskey at the end. I mean, within the rickhousing system, we have two probes that watch the actual temperatures of it, so the dynamical shift. So we know different warehouses 
heat up differently, and we're monitoring that, as well as the liquid temperature. So we can tell which barrels are heating up the quickest, what barrels are first hot pockets in the, in the rick house. All that matters into the whiskey, um, and we're still learning that. I mean, there's no yeah. – there's we're very young. I mean, it's only like – in 2001, we started distilling in the first place. Since 2013, we've had enough barrels to really get into that geekiness. But like I said, we're very geeky whiskey, and that's what we love. Yeah. Because having that data and having that only helps us make better whiskey. Um, but I know I, the flip side, I mean, everything is variable. And that's why that, like, we're not very consistent with whiskey makers. Like I said, every Starlight pick is going to be very different. It's going to be very, like... Like, it's, it's crazy to know, like, today on our barrel pick, like, we had two different ryes that couldn't be more, like, left or right. One very more old school, all spice, clove, baking spices, dense, a lot more malt. The other one was very, like, burnt orange peel, had a little bit of weight to it. The tannin was really up there. But they were distilled in the same year, literally about three weeks apart. And wow. When it came down to it, it became two different distillers with two different malts. Even going into your malts, I mean, we use four different types of malt. So if it's like Golden Promise, and I'm not going to tell the other three because they're, they're some of the ones we're using are kind of fun, kind of weird. But it's like, it's so crazy. I mean, the one, or the one ride today was an indigenous ferment. So we just let it spontaneously ferment. And we were tracking That's down. Cool. Yeah, so they basically sat in that tank. And then fermented, and like I said, no, not even a sour mash because it was a clean tank. But naturally, what was coming in on that rye was naturally going to ferment that. Yeah. Um, that's that's like a uh, that's kind of like a sort of a nod to beer brewing. There's yep. there's uh, a lot of a lot of beer brewers will will do that kind of the spontaneous fermentation on their on their beers. That's I mean that's another really cool thing to learn. Like I never knew that that's something that you guys are you guys are like mad scientists down there it's honestly the like it is the weirdest thing to say when i say this but when it comes to it it's like every distillation day is a new day like <laughs> walk here in the morning and we're tasting the distillate it varies what we're going to do with it or even when we're cooking i mean like there's some days where we're like all right let's cook this and my dad will kind of close the shoot on the grain bass and be like let's try this I'm like, all right, let's 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 go off here and see what it does like that. So it's like, when it comes to it, it's a uh, it's a it's a weird geekiness. But we do monitor everything and like everything of that. And the last pick I was talking about the indigenous because I saw someone ask. Um, that's for whiskey and wishes coming down and uh, so that right in northern Kentucky, like Cincy region. Um, but also, I want to highlight coming back to it on the weird and diversity is our like. When it comes to our finishes as well, because yeah. this is going to be one of my favorite products and favorite upcoming products, um, we do finishes and they're only first fills. So all of our sherry, all of our like so turns, ports, they're only first fills. So they're extremely like dark and complex. You get much more of that overwhelming wine influence or whatever it might be. Um, but the one I want to highlight because it's coming up and I'm really really proud of it. And what I'm when I say proud, it's going for a great cause. And you can talk about it with Bourbon Charity. Because, I mean, that barrel is going to be something that is honestly something I think people are going to enjoy. It's going to show you what Starlight can do. But also, this barrel is going for an amazing cause for an amazing charity. And this thing is going to be, I mean, it's awesome when we can drink for a change. And there's also oh. something. So, I mean, if you want to go into, like, a little bit of that. Yeah, I'll I'll take it away a little bit on this because I did want to touch on like not only the charity, but the experience that you, that Starlight and that you and your family put on for, you know, somebody, someone coming down to do a single barrel pick. I mean, I've only done that one ever on, on site at a distillery. And I can't imagine that anything will ever live up to it because I mean, you get you, you basically gave us the run of the place and you're just like, OK, we're going to just taste all kinds of stuff. We're going to figure out like where where you guys are kind of headed after we taste some things. We'll lead you down some paths. And then at the end of it, you come away with with an amazing barrel that's really, really unique. And um, yeah, so that that particular we can come back to that. But that particular barrel 
uh, that we picked for Bourbon Charity. Um, I don't think it's any secret. We can talk about it. It's a Sauternes uh, finish um, on, on a bourbon. About how old is that bourbon, um, Christian? I believe that's going to be labeled as a five because it's when we dumped the barrel initially into the Sautern. So the, the age statement stopped. So at five years is where the bourbon was at before the Sautern. Okay, so a five-year bourbon finished in Sauternes. Yep. Um, there, it's going to yield probably two hundred plus bottles yep. because we picked we picked a bigger we picked a bigger barrel, didn't we? Yes, we did. I mean, you're sitting with a sixty barrel, not your typical or your typical fifty three. Yeah. So so we but, so we picked we picked a little bit of a bigger barrel. Yeah. It's going to yield it's going to yield a few more bottles, but that's great because of the charity that it's going to benefit or the place that it's going to benefit is Norton's Children's Hospital in uh, Louisville, Kentucky. They're just across the river from you guys. And that's going to, that's going to raise a ton of money. It's going to do a lot of good and um, just, it's going to be an amazing thing once that is uh, out in, out in the market. Um, so yeah. And, and the experience that went along with it for the people that were there participating was like I, I don't know how it could be beat. Talk a little bit about that about your program. Well, our barrel program is very different than most. Um, we're not just rolling four barrels out and saying, "Here you go, pick." I mean, that's just not our style. Like I said, with, no, with having so much different types of whiskey and how many different. I mean, we have six different coopers and different entry proofs and different. Char I mean, we have literally five chars, one through four, but we also do a ISC heavy toast char one in quotation, which is really a really heavy toast. Very, very, very light. Char. Um, so having that different, so when you come here and do a barrel pick, and like I said, very lucky that we can pick and choose who we want to have down here. But like I said, we only let go of just a tiny fraction of the barrels we have because we're pushing that age statement up. Um, but when you're here on property, you get myself, my brother, my dad. We greet you. We take you on a personal tour of the estate, kind of walk you through the history hands-on. And you actually go and see my grandpa, Charles, is still. And you actually can see that original, like, the original actual property for it. But when you're coming back around, like, you get to come here into the rick, which, like, while I'm here, I, I can thief you a barrel just so I can show you what, like. <laughs> yeah. What yeah let's do it. Yeah, well, so you actually come into this room over here, and this is the very first barrels you taste are out of this rick. So we actually call this like the flavor profile because inside these ricks are mine, my dad, and my brothers, uh, just basic entry barrels, and we get a feel of what you actually like. So when we're getting a feel of what you actually like, then we can go out to the bigger three warehouses back over here and then pick out really what you want. So I'm We're, lo we're losing you here a little bit, Christian. A good thing. No, no worries. Yeah. So everything we have here, like I said, is can be thiefed out. I can show you. This is actually going to be one of my dad's barrels. So... As it goes, it goes, it goes. So you get to taste these, what we call tri these trial barrels. Um, and that gives you an idea of what you like before um, you actually need to go to the Rick House. Because when you go to the Rick House, I mean, it's going to be totally different. Because when you start tasting barrels, especially when you get past about 20 barrels. Um, so, like, when you get out of there and start tasting barrel after barrel, they get very different, right? And they get very mixed up. So when you're tasting barrels, we just want to get you an idea of where you like so we can put you on a good barrel. So if you say, hey, I like my dad's barrels, or you like my brother's or mine, then go out to the Rick House and say, okay, taste from row 26, or taste from row 8, or whatever the row might be, and then we'll try the barrels within it to figure out, okay, you like my dad's, so here's his three Cooperages, one to four. Let's pick out the ones you want. 
And then on the flip side, if you do mine, then you get to say, okay, so we've tried all these barrels. Now let's try the cast finishes with different, with different mash bills in it. And it's really a fun experience. I mean, and then at the very end, after you select about five barrels that are your favorites, we take you upstairs into our single barrel tasting lounge and then we blind taste you. And because the blind tasting at the end is always important because yeah, you might like a particular barrel and you could think it's a standout barrel, but when yeah. you do a line and when you do it without any knowledge of what you're tasting, you honestly pick a barrel, better barrel because you don't know what you're getting. Um, and the age statement and everything is taken off of it. Like you don't know if you're having a finished barrel or if you're having just a regular straight bourbon whiskey or rye whiskey. I mean, it really depends on what it is. I mean, when it came down to the bourbon charity pick, I didn't think you guys were going to initially pick the Sauternes. I think it was going to go to the Sherry. So yeah. when do it, I mean, that proves like, hey, you pick a better barrel based off a of sensory analysis when you're blind doing it. So one of the fun things about yeah. it. That, that barrel, actually, we were sort of wavering, like, was it even going to be included in the finals that we were going to ultimately pick from? And at first, we said, no, it's out. And then there was a couple people that, were, that kind of fought for the barrel. So we're like, okay, yeah. we'll, put, we'll put it in. And then in the end, it ends up being the barrel that, that gets picked by, by the group. So it yeah. was really a cool experience and and like that added little bit to the end where we're like we weren't even really gonna even consider this barrel and it ends up being the pick um so that's that's gonna be a great one it was a, a really fun experience so again thank you for that it was it was great and great to meet you when when i was there well and it comes down to it like with our barrels and as starlight I mean, as a whiskey community out there, I mean, we really can make a change for a lot, especially right now. And then what I love about being a part of this industry is we're part of a group of people who really want to make change. And then Bourbon Charity has given us that avenue to be able to support, I mean, Norton Children's Hospital, who really needs their ER and everything built back up. So you guys, I mean, helping us help them. So when it comes to the whole nine yards, I mean, bourbon and the bourbon community, I mean, it's really going full circle, and that's what you want to see. But. Yeah, for sure. And if I could just plug for one second, there is a major fundraiser going on right now with Bourbon Charity. Today is the last day that you can get in on it. It's a fundraiser, the Father's Day Ultimate Bourbon Fundraiser. So if anyone watching hasn't gotten into that, go to bourboncharity.org and just look at the, bar the bottles that you can win. I guarantee you're going to want to buy tickets. So that's my plug for that. But it ends tonight at midnight, so you got to get in. Hey. Um, Love it. So, geeky whiskey, Starlight, yeah. geeky whiskey. Love it. Well, I mean, this is, this is right up my alley. Well, we've, and talk, we've, talk, we've touched on the barrels a little bit here and there. We've talked about it. But let's, let's dig into the barrels because this is always fascinating to me. And you guys are doing really, really cool stuff. Yeah. So, Tell us about, about the six cooperages you guys are doing and how you work all those in. Yeah, so having six coopers is not like a typical distillery. Most not distillery, at all. Yeah, are solo coopered, and they use one through four, or they might even just do two chars. At our distillery, we have six different cooperages, and like I said, those five different toasts, if it's a, from the lightest of the lights, which is a heavy toast, char one quotation from one to four char. We also have charred heads, toasted heads, we have kennel and drying, and we had air dried wood 12 to 36 months and four year. So you have ultimate variability on what you have. There is such a difference onto Coopers to Coopers, even within my mash bill. I mean, I have four different Coopers just within my portfolio. Totally, totally different. And the cool thing is we have two fridge Coopers who are getting into the whiskey game by doing American Oak. Um, because the French Coopers versus American Coopers are very different of how they keep their force maintained. Um, I mean, I can go geeky all day. I mean, my senior thesis was in barrels. <laughs> but it comes to barrel influence, um, I forget the number, but my brother ran a GC up at Cornell University, and they did a study to base off of what aromatics you're getting off actual big box bourbon. And 77% of those aromas are due to barrel influence. So that yeah. tells you how important barrels are. But on the flip side, your entry proof matters as well. But the six different Coopers, like I said, on a day-to-day -day basis, we taste the distillate and we're like, okay, 
this is more sweet, this has more tannin, or not tannin, excuse me, more oils. Um, so we need more tannic, barrel, heavier char. This is lighter and fruitier, need to go char one, char two, maybe toasted heads, give a little bit of structure. And so we build these six different Coopers differently. Um, I would do the main difference, the French Coopers, the two French Coopers versus the other American Coopers. The French Coopers m mostly use, I mean, 100 or, or should, mostly use, you can order them special if you don't want air-dried wood, but mostly use air-dried wood in their stays for at least two years, all the way up to three, four, five-year air-dried wood. Um, that's called seasoning a barrel. Um, so when they see barrels they're getting rained on their heat their their mildews everything as they're drying out and that's flavor that's adding flavor and those elagitalins everything like that when they do a long toast so french coopers do long toast flash chards so long slow heating that barrel getting like the elagitalins everything out there that's going to add those light whiskey lactones to you um, and then coming around and then flash charring it and then flash charring up to one two three or four um, but the major difference, too, is their actual wood they're using within their forests are much older than typical American forests. French yeah. stand, they have a lot tighter grain, less oxidation, tighter grain, making it harder for those actual, those contractions of the barrel to get color out. Um, typically for us within ours are very, very sweet. Um, so they're more fruity. There are less of this, like, grainy, oily. They more follow under, like, when I talk about fruit notes, like especially in rye whiskey, taste our rye, you have this like burnt orange peel, citrus thing going on, and it's very light and aer aer like aromatic. One of the things that I incredibly love, that Benny's pig is awesome, by the way. Um, this is fantastic. That, like, we want to have that. So typically when you, we use French Coopers, Canton and Sagumin, Sagumin Row in the Napa Valley, they do a very famous barrel called the Icon Barrel, um, which is going to be coming out here in a little bit. Icon, whole different dig. Um, they actually do oak scan. So how you do oak scan is running those like actual individual staves through a GC machine, and actually seeing the levels of concentration of the. I love this stuff. Like I could sit that's, there. That's amazing. I can look at polygraph and being able to see what the actual are, and I can make my whiskey fit those for the best it can be it's not just a guessing game and same with canton wise canton a lot more times has that same kind of portfolio where we know exactly kind of the compounds and what we're getting into they're very cohesive uh, whiskeys and they're very very similar um, to when that's like going out so when it comes to it like those two cooperages i mean are our fruit high rye mash bills typically that are very very cleaned up so cutting at 125, 130, 135, and that, it, for the distillers who are listening, that's very, very high. And I know that, say that, but you could take a big tail cut and run those tails again to go into a lighter style and go into another type of whiskey portfolio. But having those high, high cuts, especially with our low corn mash bill, that's a very high rye, allows you to have that very big body citrus sweet notes, which I, we, we love here. Um, going into the American oaks, though, totally different. Again, the American oaks have a lot more. They're younger. They're usually heavier char, so you get more smoky. Kelvin is the king of those type of barrels. Um, the single barrel that we have on our floor right now is a Kelvin char number three barrel. That honestly has so much the smoke, but also in our sweet mash bill kind of format and our sweeter type of bourbon we make. So it's literally, you get this sweet caramelization of vanilla, like creme brulee, with a smoky dense. It's like we took a blowtorch to a creme brulee, and it's like yeah. so sweet. I don't know if this is the one. This is the one that I bought when I was there. It's barrel 1429. Yep. But this one is a vanilla bomb. I mean, yeah. it is just loaded, loaded, loaded with vanilla. I mean, so amazing. And I have to imagine it's that huge influence from the from the barrel so and you're exactly right um when it comes to it i mean we do different trials of different whiskeys so even going up on like the actual bourbons like oak influence is hugely impactful because i'm kind of segueing into the cast finishes as well so everything we do here so turn i mean is a from bordeaux um 
one of my favorite up and coming trials we're hopefully going to do here in the future um, is like a Canadian ice wine mural. And I really hope to be able to tag one of those to do that. Um, I'm hoping in a skilling up there, we'll be able to bring us down, able to fill those up and do that. Or somebody wow. up in the industry. Um, on the flip side, uh, I want to be able to do something more or less, like we have we have Sherry, we have Oloroso. I'm hoping to get some Badira. I uh, have uh, Eisvine German barrels, hopefully, like actual German ice wine lined up. Um, Port, Tawny, and Ruby. Um, I haven't got a late bottle vintage. Like, I just want to focus under those kind of portfolios. On the flip side, like I keep going over to my importer and smelling these different wine casts. So Burgundy and Bordeaux barrels, um, and also like Italian, like Amarone barrels, and Nebbiolo when it comes to Barolo. So smelling right, the different wine casts. Yeah, here's a yeah. question for you regarding this, the smelling the wine casks, which I think you would have a huge advantage. Like if you're, I don't know how all this works, but you're saying you're, some of these you're able to actually hand select. You have yeah. to have a huge advantage being, having like the winemaking background and working at wineries when you, when you came out of college to like, yeah. To go to those barrels and, and be able to like inspect it, to be able to smell it, you have to have an advantage over like some big distillery that just says, yeah, just give us a hundred barrels of the sherry and we'll take them. Well, and on the flip side, when I was there importing, Heaven Hill bought 90 Burgundy barrels, Burgundy Pinot Noir barrels. I smelt them all to pick my two. So I could get the best out of the best because okay. like we're, we're small, right? So when it comes to wine cask, most whiskey guys don't know faults. Like yeah. BA, Britannomyces, re like there's so much stuff that can go wrong with wine cask and they don't understand that because bourbon, guess what? As long as you don't get uh, like lactobacillus and go your fermentation wrong, you're typically pretty good. That barrel's pretty preserved and you can ship it across the world and be fine. Wine yeah. cask, you can't. And it, baffles me why so many people try to bring wine cask over here to america from europe in the middle of summer it's not going to happen you're bound to get these awful off aromas and that's going to show in those whiskeys i mean most people when you try our wine cask just know like me my dad and my brother are going over there and we go through i mean my brother just picked up two oloroso barrels i mean he probably smelled 40 barrels before he found two that he liked because there can't, be, there can't be two better guys to be smelling wine barrels and, and picking them than you and your brother. Well, and it's funny enough, the guys over there, the actual plant manager, like he just, he sits there with a piece of chalk and he writes X or circles and he knows what to do with them because like, it's like, what do you think of this? <laughs> this, but for the most part, like within the wine world, like it's better to bring those over in the winter. So you see us do more wine cast finishes. If you're looking, if you're going to do a barrel pick of a finish, now's the time to get it because they're turning their, um, so we do a minimum of eight months. So we start bringing them over usually when it starts getting cool, November, December, um, and then we wait those age. And then we typically start picking on them May, June, July for that like July, August modeling of it. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of the waiting period. So if you're looking for cast finishes, now's the time to come find those here. Um, and like I said, we don't have many. And so once they're gone, a lot of times we just, do two barrels, one to sell, one to keep, just like the Sauterne, one to sell, yep. one to keep. On the port barrels, we did four. Um, we had the two two Tawny, two Ruby, and they're doing one to sell, one to keep, one to sell, one to keep. We have a maple syrup barrel, one to sell, one to keep. We have a Booker Knoll barrel that was shipped to Scotland, a Scotsman, yes. got shipped back here. So both Booker barrels, both had Scotch in them back here, and then we're gonna do one to sell, one to keep. So it's like, when it comes to those cast finishes, they're all very unique. And we craft them yeah. very differently because we don't want, like, in particular, like I said, we want to be weird. We want to have wild. And we want people to come up here and explore and, like, every couple of weeks be able to find something totally different than what they found initially. I mean, that's a huge, like, benefit of having that is having those. Oh, yeah. Um, and like I said, our small releases, like, I released 22 cases of Portwood, and that's all I had. Like I said, a small little lot of it, and then once it was sold out, it sold out. I mean, it's yeah. fun to do that way because people get excited about it. And like you said, oh, for sure. 
and Starlight is starting to get a little bit bigger, like name wise out there. And I, I mean, it makes my family smile ear to ear when we get a phone call from California. <laughs> Like distributors are calling us, be like, I can, can I get this? Can I get that? And we're like, we don't even have enough for ourselves, give or take, like shipping it out to this, that, and the other. And we're trying to work on that. Um, to highlight some of the stuff, kind of what we do is we partner with like a, we first find a retail shop that's really promoted to our brand. Uh, for instance, Benny's up there. Benny's actually getting the allocation of Old Brick House. They're only getting 22 cases, and that's the entire allotment pretty much for Northern Indiana all of Illinois, Michigan up there. It's coming to Benny's, you got 22 cases and that's all you got. For the state of Indiana, it's in big red liquors and once it's gone, it's gone. For Kentucky, you got a liquor barn and that's it. And then in in the East Coast, you got one guy, awesome palate named Prov. It comes out of- Prov, yeah. Prov picked up the 22 cases for the entire East Coast allotment. So, and then that's it, that's all we had. And then once sells out it sells out and the next batch will come in we'll do the same thing we'll allocate it to the states we want and the people that we love and we'll help build the brand that way no that's great and and um like like you just said and like i said at the top of this there is a real there's a real buzz about you know what you guys are up to and i think that's because you know, you, you do things like this, and I saw it earlier tonight, I, I was flipping through some stories on Instagram, I saw like your dad and Blake were doing a tasting, uh, a virtual tasting with some groups. So I think like doing stuff like that is also, of course, very beneficial to, to your brand, but um, the, the experience that you guys put on, like all of that just kind of like snowballs and people start to people start to hear about you and people start seeking out your, your brand. And it becomes like this thing where like, well, we can't, we can't even really, it's a good problem to have for you guys. Like you're, you're getting requests for your stuff and you're not quite able to maybe fill the full request. Um, It's an interesting situation for a growing brand like yours. And the number one thing we never want to lose is lose our age statement, but we're never going to lose our, price the number one thing that our price we want to do is we don't want to cheat you and we're not going to i mean for instance you can find most carl t and old brick house rye um depending on what state you're in because there's different tax going on to it but we sell it here for 32.99 for both old for carl t and old brick house barrels are 49.99 and then our cast finishes and limited releases are 59.99 um, and we only do two barrels a year. They're both called the Family Reserve Limited Editions. Two barrels a year, they're the best ones out of the rick that are done for 100 bucks. And they're, when they're there, they're there. They're literally the best barrels we have in the rick. Um, one bourbon, one rye a year. And once those 200 bottles are gone, that's all we got. That's it. And, that's and, those, are, and those are selected by – those have to be an agreement between you, your yeah. dad, and your brother in order for that to actually be a release. Yeah, and that's it. I mean, we don't agree. Like, we won't agree on a pick 99.9% of the time. Well, so you know those are good ones that are that are coming out. Yeah, and it's so funny because we have so different palettes, but we do find the family reserve barrels. And I think we've already found the rye for next year. But we really do, like, our eyes light up. Be like, damn, this is something that is better than anything that we've had this year. Like, this is, this is it. And we found a rye, actually – two weeks ago that fit that profile and it was sweet it was candy it was confected orange peel it had spice it had body it had depth and it was just like we all kind of looked at each other and we just initially we didn't even say anything literally just took the white tape and wrote huber because we all when you see when you come here and you see a barrel with the word huber on it you'll notice we don't talk about those barrels because those are the huber barrels. <laughs> so it is yeah. honestly crazy and when you look at it i mean the family reserve bourbon in particular it literally sold out i think in like two weeks it was there and it was gone all 200 bottles and uh that's just something we're proud about and it's just as a seventh generation family member there's nothing more that i want to do than to set my kids up on a, like a tea so they can sure. hit this out because the barrels i'm putting back now will probably be my kids and my kids kids and th- when it comes to distillery it's all about generational we're a craft distillery, but when it comes down to it, we want to be like heritage brands when it comes to the basically the age statements, 
the way they do it as a legacy brand and be able to carry on that tradition. And Starlight, like I said, we are a farm to bottle, family owned, sustainable farm, and we want to make yeah. as whiskey as we can. We try all of our whiskey up to the biggest guys in the name, um, especially with the up and comers right now. On a day to day basis, I mean, we have Peerless Open, I mean, we'll have New Rift, we'll have Willingness Trail, we'll have every, even Mictor's Rye will have open, we'll have Willet open. Uh, we'll have the guys from Balconies. We'll have all this different bottles because we want to be able to compete on the level, even though we're smaller, compete on that level. And we want to come out with releases that are better and that show what Starlight is. And that's yeah. who we are. So. I, I, and and it, totally, it totally shows. I mean, seeing it firsthand and, like, being able to experience it myself in person, like, the the family atmosphere – the care that you guys put into it, the excitement that you have like tonight. I think you said you were up at three in the morning this morning and you're here tonight s still talking super excitedly about what you do. So like it comes across how much yeah. you guys care about it. So I appreciate that. And um, so at, we're coming up here on our time, but in closing, I think um, you had told or your dad had told us a story when you were down there that on Father's Day, we have Father's Day coming up here this weekend, that you guys usually get together and we'll do we'll do a batch together as uh, father and sons and kind of put that away. You're going to be doing that this Sunday? Yep. So every year on Father, well, on Christmas, on Easter, on Thanksgiving, on all the major holidays, we all get together as family. Father's Day, dad gets his two sons and we distill. And we do a big lot of whiskey called the Father's Day Barrels. We haven't released any of that yet, but it's truly a father-son. And, like, we drink other people's whiskey during the day. This year, thank God, I got one of the Wild Turkeys new bottle and bond 17 year. Oh, nice. We'll be open up one of those, and we'll be enjoying that as we're distilling. I mean, like I said, I mean, it's a great father-son, like, little project that we do. We literally start early in the morning, and we go all day, and we try to do three runs, which – Typically, long day if it's two, three is a very long day to get out of this still. And we work hard, but it, that's what we want to do on Father's Day because we love this. And this is honestly what we're so passionate about. But uh, I, I totally, I love that. I love that story. That's, I'm glad yeah. that you shared it. And so, Christian, um, you know, thank you so much for, for coming on here tonight. Um, yeah. It's been great to meet you in person. Great to hear you talk so passionately about about starlight and about your family and about what you guys are doing down there. And like I said, it comes across. So I'm sure that you've uh, got a bunch more fans tonight. Um, but again, thank you very much. And uh, let's stay in touch. Let's do this again uh, on the regular and kind of get some updates on what you guys are doing as, as things start happening down there. Well, we can't do it with either. Brand. Don't we're not that great at social media and we're trying to get our website and everything. So it takes people like yourself to really help us get our name out there. So we can't thank you enough. I mean, as you're part of the Huber family and like, honestly, we're always here. So whenever you need something, drive down, stay with us, do barrel tastings. We love it. And thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. Have a great night, Christian. And we'll talk soon. Cheers. Cheers. All right, everybody, thank you so much for uh, joining that uh, episode of the Urban Bourbon Hour tonight with Christian Huber from Starlight Distil Distillery. I mean, what a fascinating conversation. You can tell that he is so passionate about what he does. Uh, and when he says geeky whiskey, I love that. I love geeky whiskey. So for all the, uh, the whiskey geeks out there, this is the brand for you. Really, really great people, really great brand, doing some, some excellent things. Seek them out. There's a lot of friends out here in the whiskey world that can help you out. Um, so, guys, thank you again for joining. And until next time, cheers.